red and green. <laughs> so, are we recording? If it's red and green flashing, are we recording? We're going to assume we're recording. Our talk today is on evangelizing open source by getting things done. Basically, telling people it's free and that paid, source, uh, paid software is evil doesn't get you anywhere. It actually usually makes management upset with you. Now, general disclaimer, um, our opinions are our own, and they do not reflect that of our employer. I am Mark Kamrick. I am a system administrator at the uh, Department of Mathematics and Statistics at UNC Charlotte. Um, started using Linux back in 19... I can't remember if it was 96 or 97. I was too lazy in the hot summer sun to walk to the computer lab at NC State. So I grabbed a copy of Red Hat and did everything in my dorm room because it was air-conditioned. Hello, my name is Jason Edgecombe. I am the senior Linux administrator for the College of Engineering at UNC Charlotte. I do Linux admin stuff at work, and I also do some open source stuff at home, including a, a puppet module and just some other random stuff. I've been doing Linux since I installed Slackware back in 94-ish. So, yeah. Okay, quick overview. First of all, we're going to start off with the things that shall not be mentioned to users. First of all is the name of this presentation, evangelization. Never mention that to users. And secondly will be what we have jokingly nicknamed slurp, security, licensing, upgrades, revision control, reproducibility, and portability. And then a bunch of examples and where we have failed and ways we have succeeded. Evangelization, this, please, never mention it to users. Jason and I both work with people from all over the world. This summer, I'm working across, at last count, I think seven time zones on people I communicate with regularly. Evangelization means many different things to many different people. Just don't mention it. Um, at the end of the day, the users do not care about an ideology. They simply want to get things done. The next thing that should never be mentioned to users, and this is something that those of us in IT hear every day, security, licensing, upgrades, can we reproduce this? Is this, you know, under revision control? Is this portable? Security. This slide can be summed up very simply as, is this upgrade you're doing in the name of security actually for security? I have been burned, and so has Jason, many times because we did an update that was security required because someone told us to do the update. We never bothered to ask, is this just a standard update or a function release and really a, or really a security update? And a lot of times we have done security updates without them being security updates We've broken workflow, and we've also discovered management wasn't in the loop. So, and that has happened to me in several areas. Licensing. What licenses do you have? I thought the license provided that toolkit or addition. Users generally do not know their licenses. Most of the time, we don't either. Upgrades. Users don't even love to mention the mentioning the word upgrades to users in a lot of cases will get them upset. Your power users are the worst. They know how to use the system you're using. They love it. They don't want any changes. Also, the system hidden in the corner, it seems every time you get rid of the system in the corner, the system under somebody's desk, it comes back. Ubuntu Mate. The front end never changes. I love that fact of it. 
But Ubuntu Mate is based off Ubuntu. Most of the time, you can get away with having updates in the background perfectly, and you'll never see any changes. However, the front end may not change. It's based off Ubuntu. You've got to make sure your critical changes are tested. And secondly, if it's not a security upgrade, is the upgrade worth it? This is far too often what upgrades look like to most users. There's boards missing along this path. If you fall, um, this walkway is located 30 miles um, from Beaufort, North Carolina, by boat. So in this case, if you miss a step and break your ankle, there is going to be a long wait for support. Most of your users will look down, step right over that missing plank. There are going to be users who aren't going to catch it and fall. And that, unfortunately, is what upgrades look like to most users. Reproducibility revision control. In our field, this used to be a major problem. This one, actually, in the six months that I had this talk percolating in the back of my head, has really changed. In academia, revision control and reproducibility is becoming a serious concern. But, you know, this is hard. Revision control. I'm not a programmer. I always love this because I just cringe when I am told this when we're working with people. We'll never need this code again. That almost pretty much sets up, started at about six months after the paper's been published. Somewhere between six months to three years, somebody's going to be asking for the code again. Portability, the number one question I get on this is, how is this getting things done? What does this bring to the table? I don't care that I can use this free across multiple systems. This is changing, thankfully. Um, I've had code in the past three years run everywhere from all parts of Asia, including Mongolia, um, South America, I don't, Nambia. So Africa, so having code that can be portable is now critical. A lot of times code is not portable. Support. This slide could be summed up basically as users hate forms. And I will not go into it. Those of you in the room have probably been into open source forums. They can be toxic, confusing, condescending to some users. For users generally hate them. Online guides are often out of date. In my field, because of the fact you are working with a lot of people who are across the globe, the latest and greatest code we received may not have documentation in English. Or often, the documentation has been run through Google Translate. And as we know, Google Translate always gives very accurate translations. Not. Some of you in the room may remember this term of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It was a term used a lot back in the 90s describing a certain company, and we called it FUD. This really applies to small projects. Small projects who have a lot of people yelling and screaming back and forth in their forums, it is very hard for us to go, we think this will work for you, we've done some initial testing, take a look at it. People go into the forums, and all they see is people arguing back and forth over minutia normally, very scientific details. And I've become to be a believer that sometimes a separate developer's forum is a great idea because of this. So one of the things you need to be concerned about is how user-friendly is something. First off, new users are scared of the command line because it doesn't give, you know, you're looking at this prompt that doesn't give you any clues about what you can actually do. It's just, it's waiting for you and it, it, there's no hints, there's no clues. And you do have to realize that maybe your favorite language or tool might not be the best in this situation. Uh, Mark likes Python. I, I'm actually trying to learn Python. Uh, R is better for many statisticians. 
it's uh, kind of a joke that the uh, you know, R is great because it's written by statisticians. It's also not so great because it was written by statisticians, not programmers who understand software development. And another thing is, is it easily learned? Uh, Pearl. Mark and I both miss Pearl. We like the camel. Also along user-friendly lines, uh, is you know, this program or tool may be the best at doing one thing. It may be the best, but it's also extremely hard to learn, and users won't remember how to use it. I have this problem of, you know, I, I maybe I made some reports and somebody wants me to tweak them, and this tool I wrote happened, happens to be R, and you know, I'd, I might touch it once every year or two, and I, every time I go, I don't use it enough to remember how to use it, and I have to go learn how to do whatever the thing is every time. And the interface may be confusing to, you, to new users. So <clears throat> another concern is maintainability and also the community. Once something's in use, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and this can be a problem even once the project's died it's, it's hard to move the users away. And sometimes projects come back to life. You know, open source is never truly dead because you can always find the code and you can resurrect it yourself if you want. But this can also be an issue. Classic example of this is one called XFIG. Any users in here? It's heavily used in the mathematical statistical world and it was used heavily years ago. This is a vector graphics editor. Um, how many of you were alive in 1981? Quite a few of us probably in this room. Um, the problem with the tool is it actually died for about five years. You'd see a fix, but there really was no movement forward in the community. And then the other problem was anybody who grew up past the early 90s could not figure out how to use this interface. It literally looks like something that we would have seen alongside of Mosaic, if you remember it, back in the day when we were all running um, deck stations or Solaris. Now, fortunately, this project has actually resurrected itself. I was in the middle of starting to ban it on our systems because I was getting concerned because it had not been really touched in five years. And the project actually took some major updates, came back to life, and is really heavily in use again. My older users, and when I say older, above 30 or have been trained in it, love this application. My newer users are really heavily concerned. And the, bigger, the biggest competitor, some of you may have heard of this, is actually Inkscape. And that is the one that's really heavily used now. Now, ways we have succeeded. Configuration management. You're going to see this a lot in our presentation. The ability to keep multiple machines and installs configured to the same thing is critical. And keep your slurp documented, supported, and updated. Security. First of all, work with security teams and management. I have dealt with far too many people who are like, oh, it's got to be updated. It says the word security. Sometimes it's better to let management make that decision. If it is something minor, it may not be worth it. Um, in some of the uh, multi-named executions in the Intel chips recently, they've had to have serious discussions. Do we want to apply all these patches, which are going to cut support by 10 to 15%, sorry, not support, speed by 10 to 15%, or if it doesn't matter, are we willing to assume the risk? That is above my pay grade. Let someone else decide that. Is the upgrade needed right now for security? Can it wait a month until a project is ended? That has saved a lot of problems. And most importantly, configuration management, critical. Keep track of what you're using. The number of times that I've worked with other system administrators, reminded of this step, keep a spreadsheet of what's being used in your area. 
and also who is actually using it, you will be amazed. You find out there's that one guy who uses it twice a year. And you're maintaining 10 licenses for him or her. Do you need those? Can you move that person to the other tool? Um, it also helps when management sees this because management can go, is this critical enough for you, for you to lose support X or Y in exchange for this license? It's amazing how fast these one-off licenses go away. Consult with legal when releasing software. I don't know if how many of you were in a previous talk here that um, Eric gave, and he mentioned, you know, open source licensing can be confusing. I will say a step further, a lot of large entities today actually have someone you can call who handles that. Use them. Upgrades. Once again, this is, if done correctly, 90% configuration management. Puppet or Ansible are the ones Jason and I prefer. Always test. I see far too often somebody rolls an upgrade, never tests it. This one is a fun one. This one has really become a hot topic in academia and science. Revision control and reproducibility. Fortunately for me today, most of the stuff I deal with is R, Python, Fortran, a little bit of C++. We all know, as I look around this room, most of you are in IT. This is easy to revision control. It's part of the software development process. Today, we make code available a lot with papers. People get questions back. Believe it or not, a lot of times those questions are actually answered in the check-in and check-out comments. When you go through, a, person, a question will be asked like, why um, in this loop did you decide to do the if statement here and run this calculation instead of this other calculation? Most of the time, the person who wrote the code doesn't remember that anymore. They can look in their check-in, check-out comments and actually see it. And because of the fact we're starting to actually get users who were used to revision control in other places, we're actually starting to see GitHub and GitLab repos used for some code releases and papers because the person on the other end can probably answer the question for themselves if they have access. All right, so another concern about revision control and reproducibility. Uh, faculty and management want to be able to see who did what and when, so they essentially they want an audit trail. Now, this is one of the significant drivers of revision, revision control, so you have the audit trail and this, this can be used to assign blame, but another way you can use this is to just better understand who needs more training. So if you know that someone messed something up, then you can say, all right, don't do, don't do it that way, do it this way, let's move on. It's not always about blame, but the audit trail is king. Configuration management, if you're using it properly, you'll already know how to use revision control. And you can teach it a lot easily, more easily and faster. Should be easy for revision control. We all think that. Most of us have software backgrounds. Most of my users are mathematicians, statisticians, criminal justice, sociologists, uh, psychologists, they don't. They know how to do their job very well using the tools they know how to use, Python and R in most cases. It's very easy just to do a small training group, teach everyone on the team at once or an indiv individual training stuff, get them started. I've always been amazed. Revision control is almost like Legos. You teach them how to put a few blocks together. It's more complicated than that, unfortunately. You lead them to it. And within a few months, you typically find they start picking it up. And then you get into the chain, the real strange questions of, okay, how do I merge a checkout into his code? And what's this fork thing? But you've got to get them started. This one is always a fun one that we don't like to discuss. Bit rot. It's real. Uh, especially in my area of math and science, 
papers from the 1970s and 80s can still be very relevant and needed. I have actually converted latex files that were used in the 1980s. I've helped clean them up and get, bring them in to a modern latex compiler because the paper was still relevant and other papers were going to be written based off of this paper. And I can also say I have partially gotten WordPerfect files open from the late 80s. I got data out of some Lotus 123 files. I did not get the whole set setup out of them. Latex, I have gotten tons of stuff out. And this is the reason that in academia today, you're seeing more of a push for latex, markdown, and other text-based tools. We're dealing with another thing recently called PDFA, PDF archive, which is basically, for those who have been around, it's roughly the first version of PDF that ever came out. It's kind of basic. No videos, no hyperlinks out. It's just a basic PDF that can be opened and examined. And it's very nice, very simple. This is all because of the fact there's too much stuff out there that 20 years from now, no one's going to be able to open. Portability. A lot of times, portability is actually hampered by licensing. Does the overseas entity that wants to run your code have a license to use it? The second one is one that a few years ago was pretty important to me, which was we were using proprietary compilers. So for the application, we were able to get 15% performance increase in GCC, 40 to 50% performance increase using uh, proprietary compilers. Unfortunately for us, we did all the later testing in the proprietary compilers. Almost nobody who used the code externally to us asked for the code to be compiled against proprietary. Everybody wanted GCC. The person we gave the code to who paid for the project had access to the proprietary compilers. They were happy. It would have saved us a lot of time if we had maintained a separate compile structure. And today we would probably use Jenkins, CI, or something else to you know, compile both at the same time. Because, yes, the initial project was a success, but the people who used it later needed everything done in GCC. And the second one, which I actually consider very fun, is we're also starting to see the rise of different processor architectures. You can run Python anywhere. Um, just at this conference, I found out that you can actually get a $100 board that's 3 by 3 inches that has CUDA cores on it. I've got code written right now that uses CUDA cores heavily. We've never run that thing on anything under a large workstation. That might be something we're doing the next little bit. But I actually have had projects for data analysis run on small boards in the field. Not by us, but we have found out that the code we wrote is being used in these projects. So in that case, we did everything on Intel hardware. They're using ARM hardware. So having it written in something that can be ported quickly and easily is starting to be more important. I wish there was a real easy answer to portability. Back again, online support is often not great. Making guides for usage, always important. Actually having someone test your guides is very important. The number of times we have found out when we're reviewing papers or running code that we're actually the first person to outside of whatever entity it came from to actually test it. We're the first. If you're handing out code to someone, it's better to have other people test it. I enjoy using graduate students for this because they're available, and it's always fun to watch how bad the documentation can really be. This one, at first, was difficult for me. Recognize opportunities. As a system administrator, you always cringe naturally. I want to try my favorite Project X. Well, don't always say no, and especially if it's a tool that's very tuned to a specific field. Look at it, 
in the case of the one I'm about to mention, at the time, all of our commercial tools and some of the op other open source tools ran faster and, in my opinion, not as, maybe a little bit simpler. But this t next tool actually did things very well. So make sure you don't have a competitor and give it a run. The tool I'm referring to is Singular. I doubt many of you do linear algebra heavily, night and day. This tool is a German project, very well documented today. At the time, it wasn't. But we had to do 20 runs of, an of a calculation. The commercial tools were taking anywhere from 10 to 20 hours to do each run. Singular was doing it in about 30 minutes. So this really sped things up. Yes? Um, I'll, I'm going to refrain from naming any commercial tools. I'll, I'll happily tell you offline, but I, I still work all these vendors. They're all great tools. One of the things you discover is in the sciences a lot of times, especially in mathematics and statistics for PhD projects, you will a lot of times are ahead of the curve. I imagine if you did this experiment today, you would probably find the commercial tools have caught up. Yes? Believe it or not, um, that was, yes, the question was, did we get the same answer of both tools? The sad part was the paper was written, submitted to be reviewed, while my automatic scripts were still running the check mechanism. And they actually did not submit the tools until the first, sorry, they, the paper did not go out until after the first five test runs had completed. So we had a really good idea that the tool was working and working well. And by being an open source community, we had a very good feel. Um, the people behind this project are very knowledgeable in their field. And we had a really good idea that it was going to work. And we had trusted the tool. And yes, they, we, but we did trust but verify. So, and also recognize, oh, the next one's a little bit of a personal story against me. I grew up with a red hat. And I had just gotten drugged through something called the Novell Linux desktop uh, when that was huge. I doubt any of anybody remembers it. Jason does. He suffered through it also. It was based off of SUSE. At the time where I worked, was using Novell, which I can mention since it doesn't exist anymore. And we were a little bit leery of changing to another operating system. We had our Red Hat workstations working great. Everything was wonderful, and then my users start coming in going, yes, I'm doing this at home. I'm using Ubuntu. And a really hard decision for me was I had to recognize that for the end user, do you want to train them to your setup, or do you want to take the training they know? And by the time the 10th or 15th person had come through my door, saying they were using Ubuntu, that's when we started testing Ubuntu and deployed it. Um, if you look at this laptop, you'll notice I have a Fedora sticker. At the moment, it's running Ubuntu because I'm testing out the newer release of Ubuntu in preparation for what we'll see in the next LTS release next year. It's just easier for me and saves training time to run Ubuntu. Almost every person I have walking through the door is at least familiar with an Ubuntu flavor. Some of them use Mate, some of them use, most of them are using Mainline. But do I want to train them to use the applications they know how to use, or do I want to also train them in how to use Linux? It's easier to go with the flow. The other thing I love is recognize the gems that are worth utilizing and can be used everywhere. TextMaker in the mathematic world is amazing. It's a latex editor that works across Windows, Linux, and Mac. Exactly the same. It's, same thing goes with Microsoft VS Code. Relatively new player in the market. It's amazingly wonderful because it works the same everywhere. It also has a great Git integration for covering up that last mile of users who, they're not quite comfortable with the command line. They can code, they can do Python. But at the end of the day, it's just easier for them to click. Business conditions. This one was another one that really changed my career and Jason's career to a certain extent. 
The Great Recession hit us. When proprietary software becomes cost prohibitive, that open source software that they keep hearing just as, that's just as good, they're actually going to take a look at. I had a lot more proprietary pieces of software in use earlier in my career in mathematics and statistics support. Today, almost all of them are gone, and R and Python are king. I actually had um, quite a few graduate students. I would keep up with them and talk to them as they went in the job market five, ten years ago. And it was amazing because almost everything was a commercial piece of software. A lot of them are in this town, so it's bank-related software. And then as the recession hit, a lot of them start going to small, mid-sized businesses. And suddenly, they're being handed, here is your package. This includes every software license you need and your pay. Have a nice day. Started hearing a lot more about open source software when people had to pay for the licenses. The other thing we have found is yearly software subscriptions get expensive. Therefore, they get canceled. Then you turn around and you've lost support for the code or tool. And it goes back to portability because you suddenly can't run the code you have. That was another painful lesson for quite a few people I deal with. Python. I'm a, I was a Perl guy. I wrote probably, well, let's be honest, probably over 100,000 lines of code for various things in the 90s into the early 2000s. I loved it. There was a personal issue with the fact that I think this applies to many Perl users. I would go back and look at my Perl code and not really figure out what it was doing. It's a great language, but you can do the same thing 50 different ways. The bigger thing was Python. I could find a student, a lot of times even a freshman or sophomore, who had at least seen Python, knew the basics, and I could bring up in a week to two weeks to having them useful. Perl, they'd never heard of it. They definitely didn't know what the camel meant, nor did they love the camel, which is the mascot for Perl. And then finally, the real final death knell for Perl in our space was Python's usage in data science. Python is heavily used for data analytics today. You let the old tool go when the old tool is no longer working for you. And another big thing that's been occurring recently is parallel processing. I don't know if many of you have done it. Python's ability to do simple parallel processing is amazing. I've had several projects past year, people come in, I received 2,000 data files, and I've got to open every one of them. This is going to take a month. Throw it onto a 48-core machine and have it open 47 to 48 files at one time, suck them in, process them all at the same time, especially when you have machines laying around that have 196 gigs of memory, and each text file is only 2 megs. You can pretty much pull all those files in quickly, get them into a data set, into a Python, we generally use pandas data frames. Get the data frame generated, save it back out as one CSV file. You have saved a lot of time because what could be done one at a time can now be done 48 at a time. The other good thing is once something's in use, like I said earlier, this was a bad thing, but once it's in use, it's not going anywhere. Python is heavily being used now. I hate to say it, but I am expecting Perl to return. I, I'm, I'm expecting something to get hot with, with Perl and it return again. This next one is something that really has been an important business condition. How many of you remember when, PC, when Steve Jobs said, PCs are going to be like trucks? They are still going to be around. They're still going to have a lot of value, but they're going to be used by one out of X people. Well, people still need to use the PCs, and they're going to have specialized needs. And we, everyone in this room is dealing with those specialized needs. So the PC is not going away, at least not from our perspective. Workflow, 
This is another one that has become really, really heavily in my area. Workflow is the sequence of steps involved in moving from the beginning to the end of a working process. And that's Merriam-Webster's definition. Simple automation that speeds up business processes can save hours over the course of a year. Open source software is great for this. It reduces mistake by users. And in my case, many of my administrative, non-technical lecturers actually use Python regularly now, but they don't realize it. And some of them actually have started to learn to code Python because of this. Merging CSV files. An administrative assistant receives 10 CSV files once a semester, do X, Y, or Z with it. List of users from websites. Um, a big thing in our area now is you get a data set in, you open it up, the first thing you do is you drop columns out of it because this data set was mailed to five people. You only need a subset of those columns and due to security reasons in our areas now, if we don't need it, we get rid of it. You can't lose something you never had. But all this stuff is very easily um, done with Python or other open source technologies. And these have really started picking up speed in our areas. I actually um, am very excited to see that Microsoft is deploying Python now. Makes it a lot easier for us. Other simple tools. Text Expander is a very simple script on GitHub. It's just a basic bash script. You hit a shortcut key you set up, it gives you a list of things to paste into the document. You select which piece of text you want, it pastes it into whatever document you have up. For a lot of professors and lecturers who uh, run on our Linux desktops or researchers who have to teach, you get the same question from student 15 times or the same type assignment notes have to go out. You can save the snippets of text and just paste them. These tools have been available in the Apple world for quite a while. Another one that everybody forgets about, Bash aliases. These have been around for since Bash began, before that seashell. People forget about them. The next one is a little more controversial. I highly recommend you consult with your security teams before you use it. Cron at. The number of times I hear, I need to push this out to a cluster, run this job overnight remotely, and we're like, you have a high-end workstation for your work. How about you just at schedule this job to start at 9 p.m. tonight. It'll be done by 4 a.m. When you get in your office, you can do it. I will warn you, cron jobs have also gotten me dirty looks because we've automated the jobs to run at 3 a.m. to 4.30 in the morning. So the workers, when they get in, give me dirty looks because they used to get basically a 20 to 30 minute coffee break when they started their code off in the morning because it had to run. Well, we've automated all that overnight. Very simple. People tend to overlook the simple because they're focused on the bigger things. Do you have that Docker container deployed? Have you checked on the security settings? Have you run the SCAP tests? Your configuration management. A lot of times system administrators forget that what your user does day to day is a lot of times more important. Once again, users remember the simplest automations. I set up a ZFS system using FreeBSD to suck in 50 gig data sets repetitively. When we did this, it was an amazing project. Does the user remember that? No. The user remembers the one hour I spent on a simple automation which takes in a bunch of CSV files for something he has to do 10 times a year that he hates doing. Basically, he clicks on a script. What used to take him five hours a day is now done in less than 20 minutes. The ZFS system setup took a couple weeks. It's one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever done, all into Z, deep dive into ZFS. He remembers the very simple automation. So things you need to worry about when you're looking at the community. First off is, is there a vibrant community around an open source tool? 
Has there been in a release in the past year? That's a good test. Uh, who here remembers Perl 5? You know, there was not a major, you know, Perl 5 was, was, you know, like, that was the version for like five years. You know, Perl 6 took forever to come out. Uh, and if the community is vibrant, then your users will be bugging you. They will be saying, we want the latest, and we want the latest version. And also, successful usage will cause the tool to spread. And talking about support, uh, outside support or paid support could be a good thing. Uh, you need, you pro you're probably going to have to accept that there are some paid apps that are going to be better or a better alternative than open source. I know this we're at an open source conference, but yeah. basically use what is the best tool and what makes the most sense. Don't push open source just because it's open. Next one. Eat your own dog food. Actually use the tools you're supporting. You really can't push an application if you don't use it. And people are not going to be willing to use an application if they don't see you using it first or see a coworker using it first. Jason and I, for instance, have both done a lot of small data analysis projects to answer management questions, everything from the number of users connecting to a server. Um, Puppet Ansible, you get a lot of data out of Puppet and Ansible. The number of machines that are picking up data, um, picking up updates quickly and on time. Those type things. And once again, Python, for those of us who are, simple, or who, those of us who are system administrators, is an excellent tool. Actually use the systems you support. The number of times I've visited other places and done things where I've walked into a room and seen the local Linux administrator using a Windows box as his primary machine with the Linux box in the corner, maybe a test machine, your users pick up on that. And as you're using the boxes, find the annoyances. Uh, in our case, we had a situation a couple of years ago after a migration where the users, instead of experiencing a three-second login, were experiencing a 15 to 20-second login. It was just a simple change affected by AD with the way Kerberos was doing some authentication. Pretty easy to pick up in the logs, but users don't complain until it annoys them enough to come find you. And if it annoys them enough to come find you, it's probably too late. And now the question and answer. Um, I'm Mark Hamrick. He's Jason again. Any questions or answers? Yes. Hmm? The question is, are TextMaker and Licks anywhere comparable? Yes and no. I like Licks. It is, I forget the exact terminology. Licks shows you more on screen what is happening with your document. It actually shows you some of the long-term formatting. Whereas any of the tech editors are basically going to show you the stuff you've typed in in the, let's use the, in the LaTeX or the Markdown-esque language. Also, Lick, Licks can dump out LaTeX, but sometimes that LaTeX may not be quite what you expected. So with, if I'm involved in the process, for a lot of the research teams I work with, I basically force down the use of either TextMaker or a LaTeX tool directly. Because the mantra that sort of enforces is, you are interested in the content on the page. Make sure your equations are correct. Make sure your um, language is correct. And you worry about the formatting after you do the compile at the end, or the, the compile of the latex at the end. Whereas with Lix, you're sort of worried about that formatting earlier on. And we typically steer away from Lix. I have quite a few users using it. Years ago, you could find actual paid tools that would provide support and actually give you a word-like environment for... Um, LaTeX, those have basically gone by the wayside except for one which is extremely expensive.
because it is meant basically for final fit and finish for publishing. In other words, if you have 50 people writing LaTeX, the administrator or an office manager type position will have that tool before they send out to, to the publisher to make sure everything looks good. But generally, we just run straight LaTeX because that's the process. Lick sort of hides that from you and shows you on the, on the screen, you know, this is highlighted, this more looks like an article format, whereas TextMaker and the other LaTeX tools are just going to show you the code and maybe a preview on the side. Um, the preview features of most of the modern LaTeX editors are good enough now, though, to where they'll do it on the fly, except you have to um, click on it to get back in the code where you want to go. You just can't click on it and type, start typing on the actual generation code. It doesn't work so well on a Raspberry Pi, I discovered recently. A graduate student was complaining that their code typing at home was running a little bit slow with the editor, and then I discovered they were doing it on a Raspberry Pi. But once we turned the preview off, it actually worked great. Doing the preview generation on slower processors doesn't always work well. Yes? Mm-hmm. Cool. We'll start with that one first. Uh, first question is, what Python library are we using for parallelization? We're using several. I've got a bunch of them. Um, the simplest one I always teach first, because it's the easiest to grok, is I believe the parallel for loop, par4 comes out of it. I don't remember the exact name of the library, but just do Python parallel for loop. It'll pop right up in Google. That is always the easiest route at first, because it's the easiest to grok. Instead of doing one thing, you're doing up to the number of processors on the machine at a time. And if you have a matrix, for instance, a lot of times what I deal with is a person needs to initialize a matrix. One, two, 100,000. Well, they have to do a calculation for each cell. But if the first cell is I, and I plus one are not dependent on each other, you can then come back and do, you know, that calculation in on most des desktops eight at once. So that is the easiest. They can grok that quickly, understand it. That's the general takeoff. A lot of times that actually will knock off a quarter to a half the code run. So they're happy and they leave and they don't come back. Another one is not really a library. It's a tool I've been playing around with. We've got a couple projects that are starting to use it. It's called Dask, and that is basically a version of Pandas and NumPy that is built to do parallel up front. So, for instance, when you open a data set, you actually think, sorry, data frame. Another problem with jumping between R and Python is the terms are too similar and you get confused. It uses a Pandas data frame, and it basically opens what you think is one data frame in Dask, but it's actually multiple pandas data frames underneath, underneath, so they can do multiple things at once quietly. We're also seeing a lot of mathematical and statistical libraries now in NumPy, for instance, where a function will have an equivalent call. One is for single core, the other function call is for parallel. Those I'm not as familiar with um, because I get into those in the specific projects I work on and there's too many of them, of them to remember because every function you use is in a different area. So I could put you in contact with some of the area-specific people for if you have a weird calculation to run. Next question. Um, I am at, I believe, M-M-H-E-M-R-I-C at Twitter. And since you're the... Fourth or fifth person has asked about it. I guess I'll start looking at my Twitter again. <laughs> I gave it up for a while, and uh, but I've been asked multiple times at this conference, so I can look at it again. But it's essentially the first part of my email address. I there is a my understanding there is a VS Code extension for LaTeX. I do not encourage it. I've heard it's great. We have a large knowledge base in the departments of users of TextMaker. It's very simple. If a person can't find me or I'm too busy to stop and help them right now, 
they can quickly find someone else who knows TextMaker. It's, I'm not even going to say TextMaker is the best of breed, but because of the fact it works across all three major operating systems we use, generally there's always someone available who can help a person to answer it. And most of this, especially with TextMaker, has gotten so simple now once you're familiar with it, that the questions that come in a lot of times, I'm having to send them to professors or other people who are more familiar with the academic question they're asking. You know, that weird linear algebra symbol or weird not theory notation that's only used by less than 500 people worldwide, I'm not that familiar with. So, and honestly, most latex questions I get today, I am referring on. Because after just some initial work, TextMaker has gotten to the point it works well. That being said, I, I know I have one person using VS Code. We won't even go into the VI and Emacs users who, you know, if you do not install the specific version of VI for them on their machine, you will hear about it, and they will make you think it is the worst configuration management error you've had in six months. So, yeah, um, it's kind of funny. You look at my configuration management scripts for Puppet, and you'll see a comment sometimes on certain machine configurations of, Warning, non-standard, make sure, you know, usually we install, I think, I forget which one of the Vim packages, but you'll see on certain machines, you know, Vim improved or whatever version of Vim they prefer or Emacs they prefer on their machines. And the machines they regularly use, we just go ahead and add that so we don't have to hear about it. And that's another nice thing about configuration management is it allows you those options so that when you hand them a new machine, because they ran a calculation you told them not to run because it was on a small form factor and they ran a calculation for six weeks and a hard drive died and you're having to give them a spare, you can quickly just set the configuration settings the same and reproduce the machine. So, and that's, that's great because it does allow for an... Ex configuration allows you to give more customization, customization to end users to allow them to do what they want to do and the tool sets they want. To use. Yes? You talked today about license information. Um, on the Windows side, I understand there's a lot of, there's a lot of freedom in Microsoft's product and some that's within their own license information. What, uh, what software tracking options are there on the Linux side? I know there's probably flaws because there's a lot of application logic, that sort of thing, but for Windows, do you have any challenges there? Um, Jason and I both, most of the things on the Unix side are also very similar in, our, in the sciences. It's usually based off of Flex. Licensing uh, Flex, the name has changed a few times over the years. And exactly right. That's some of my data analysis tools are actually going into those logs and actually generating the usage. Okay. Because what people tell you they're doing and they're doing are two different things often. And often they don't realize, with especially certain proprietary applications, they come at you like, I need five more users. And you look at them and pull up the log and say, your team members... Tom, Dick, and Jane, here's a listing of all the times they've been using it. Like, they haven't even been at the country th during this time period. I know they're not working. And you just gently smile at them and go, you may want to ask them if they can close their copy out. Um, that has literally resolved probably 95% of my licensing issues, just having them close it. So that's the typical stuff we use. Some of them actually integrate into... Um, we have a couple of license servers that actually have been moved over to, to integrate directly into SCCM for monitoring. But the real specific to our areas, we typically monitor ourselves so that you can start to see things going on. I have um, quietly notified a few professors over the years, hey, you know, this person's doing work for you. You specifically said you did not want to use product X in the meeting. You've got three students, you know, you've got somebody using product X. And you may want to address that. And often what we find in those cases is that's a sign, you know, hey, it's not a sign of license abuse, it's a sign of the person is holding on to a crutch instead of moving over to the newer tool being used. And it's good to let people know the first two weeks of a project, that's a minor annoyance. When you're one week from a deadline, that's critical. So it's better to get that cleaned up early and the issue trained out early. A lot of times getting some of that data in early is a good tool. Any other questions?
Well, in that case, thank you for coming, and uh, good to see all of you.